How are we doing, guys? It's another Sunday Night Live session. You're watching the Watercraft Journal. I am the editor in chief of the Watercraft Journal. My name is Kevin Shaw, and you are watching me live from the internet. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, we are. Um, <laughs> what's the color? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I have another box right here, too. <laughs> we could talk about that one too. Um, so yeah, we uh, we got a hell of a show to do. We want to welcome Billy is here. Everyone say hello to Billy. All right, fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, so I really don't have a lot of news. Typically, I start this off talking about you know like spend like 10, 15 minutes talking about like just catching up on like news and what's going on. Um, Upcoming videos. Obviously, if you haven't already seen it, we did the uh, we we published the full review and installation tutorial on the PWC Art uh, Race Diffuser Sponsons. That is live. That went live, I think, on Tuesday. Uh, I did do a teaser of the uh, Ultra 310 LX. It was just a short clip that I wanted to put up. Something kind of fun. And uh, I do not know what AEW is. So, okay, Diego, I saw your post earlier, but I don't know what that means. AEW. Um, sorry. Uh, but we, uh, let's see. For I can't, I, I got bad news. I don't have, actually, I have no news. Uh, <laughs> I have no update on the red jerseys. I hadn't, I, I didn't hear back at all. So I don't have any news on the red jersey. So I, I need to chase down the guys at Windrider who we work with for the jerseys and see what the ETA is on those. But uh, as of Wednesday, I had no update. So, whoops. Um, and oh, that's I need to I need to grab something. I can't believe that I got this back. But David Perry, David Perry of Valrico, Florida. David Perry had won the Hydroturf backpack. And U.S. Postal Service sent it back to me. So if if David Perry is watching tonight, please message me. Please email me. We need to get your right address because apparently the post office doesn't think you live there. So they bounced it back. So I want to send you a backpack. You want a backpack. Um, I really don't want to pay postage twice, but I'm going to. Um, but anyway, I want to use uh, or I want to send that back to you. And hopefully you get to enjoy it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, JD, I have used them in salt water. And you just hose them off. And then when you get home, you oil them down like everything else. Just WD-40 them when you get home. But, yeah, I use them in salt water. It's what you do with anything. <laughs> I don't know how that's not clear. All right, um, so update on the jersey. There's no update. Uh, videos coming up. Videos coming up is actually, yeah, well, my tie-down straps last three months. Well, you know, then you're not taking care of them. <laughs> Take care of your stuff. <laughs> Spray them down, man. Get get a good silk uh, silicon-based, you know, the WD-40 silicone, or you can get a, even a... a there's a million different sprays, but start hosing them down. Hose down your materials. Do it. Wash them down, and then spray them down. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't trust you. I don't trust anyone. <laughs> Yami Shield. Use Yami Shield. I don't care what you use. You can use Crisco, as far as I care. Maybe bacon grease is the answer. I think bacon grease is the answer is the most things, but you know, that's why I'm 30 pounds overweight. Um, but. Let's see. Upcoming videos. Upcoming videos are the one that's probably next on plate is the Damn Team the Sea Ride. It's being edited right now. 
And then um, uh, Damn Tennessee Ride, the footwell, and I, I have something to show you regarding, I have a story, I have a video coming out about sea footwells that do not, the sea footwell video does not apply to Yamas, does not apply, apply to Kawasaki's. I'm telling you, it doesn't. All right. Even the new deeper Kawasaki footwells on the new ultras are nowhere near as deep and obnoxious as the Sea-Doo ones. They have a very gentle rise in the back. So if you tilt the ski, you can get all the water out. All right. If you drive really fast with your truck, you'll get all the water out. sea <laughs> You have to go 100 miles an hour <laughs> to get all the water out of those footwells. It's a, it's a pill. So I have a video about the sea footwells, footwells, um, and I might as well talk about it. So I had put up a post on Facebook a while ago making a joke about sea footwells footwells and how much water they hold. They, they hold, uh, believe it or not, they hold uh, about 40 gallons of water each. And I'm not joking. Filled to the brim. If you leave it out with no cover, it will fill up to 40 pounds each or 40 gallons each. And that's a lot of water. And so we did a, uh, uh, I did a little video talking about how to properly, you know, how to properly drain them, how conventional, like, oh, tilt up the trailer. I'm like, well, you've got an extra 180 pounds in that ski kind of like having a full-size rider on that ski and you trying to tip up the, the trailer. And because the average buyer is 54 years old, I don't see the middle upper middle-aged guy dead pressing the front of his trailer up to empty out the footwells of two sea dudes. I just don't. Call me crazy. So we talk about different ways to empty them. And all of a sudden... I get a text message on Facebook and they go, have you tried this? I go, I don't even, I don't even know what it is besides the name that is called the suck matic which was probably what your friends called your mom when you were in high school. Oh, but uh, no, uh, we, I never heard of these guys. I'm like, what, what the hell is this? And a uh, really good video came out. They're out of Australia. They 3d print these things. All right. They're totally 3D printed. All right, here we go. This is really, this is, you know, where it's all about is this guy. Ah, it's still full of water. <laughs> ah, it's still full of water. <laughs> it's on my desk. <laughs> all right. <laughs> As you can see, I'm really prepared. All right. So this is the Succomatic. And what it does, if we can get any sort of light, there we go. All right. What it does, it's a bypass, it's a bypass suction valve. Okay. So let me explain what happens here. You attach your hose to this fitting. And then you have this corrugated hose that just threads on like so. All right. And it's a it's a lightweight little plastic. I mean, you can even, maybe, maybe you can hear my fingernail scratching on the, on the microphone. Okay. I mean, it's, they pop these things out of a 3D printer. All right. Now you guys might be looking at this going, how do I put a garden hose on this? Well, it's because we're Yanks. We're, we're Americans and we don't have the male female style quick release garden hoses. We have the old school threaded hoses. So you got to go to Ace, you know, Ace Hardware or Home Depot or even the garden section at Walmart. All right. Screw on your screw on one of these female adapters. Put it on your hose. Locks right in. Okay. Well, <laughs> there it goes. Now it's locked. Jeez. And here's what happens. Water comes in through here, and as water hits this U-turn, it creates a vacuum. It the, the, the return route of water actually creates suction because it's so much mass moving. And the the hose coming or the water coming out of your garden hose, it exits out of here. 
Okay. In addition to the water, you got to stick this thing inside of the footwell and it'll pull all the water out. Okay. Now here's the trick. It's kind of wasteful because you're pumping, you know, it's like you're running your garden hose all over your driveway. Um, it's a little wasteful, but I did find out that if you get the water really moving, you know, if you get, you know, you turn up, the, you know, you crank up the hose and it's really pumping out and it's really spitting out of this hose and it, and you'll hear it purge all the air out of the system and start siphoning water out of your footwell. You can kill your hose until, quite frankly, until you get the weight of the water isn't enough to, to offset the suction. So a, a couple inches of water. And then you turn your hose back on and pulls it out if you don't want to waste a bunch of water. Otherwise, you can just run your garden hose and it'll pull it out in less than a minute. Okay? But it will just completely pull everything out of here as it drips onto my pant leg. Um, this works really good. The other thing is that they actually give you a whole bunch of attachments, which is kind of neat. Um, to get around, to get the water that's around, like, you know, your, your carpet, you know, the, your footwell carpet, they give you a neat little 3d printed attachment, just like a, <laughs> it's kind of like buying a, a vacuum cleaner and you can go in there and it'll siphon up all the little corners and get all that out. If you, and there, oh, wow. I got two of them. Why do I have two? Um, this is kind of neat. It's a kind of a pseudo screen. If you have a lot of debris, a lot of leaves or things like that you don't want that be trying to get jammed up in here you can put that little jobber on and you know that's part of the kit uh what else we got i'll be damned i got another one of these okay um oh last one this is kind of cool if you want to do it this way um and pull it out Problem is you have a lot of air that needs to be evacuated out of the system. So it's really going to go, and it's really going to pull in a lot of air. Um, it's a little less efficient. It works, but if you're in it to be quick and get the job done, the suck matic is a, it's a nice little, it's affordable because it's all 3D printed. Uh, there's no real trick, you know, billet or anything like that. You're not paying for crazy materials or anything like that. Um, yes, the suck -a -matic was in fact the name of the hair cutting tool that, as Garth said, it's sucking out my will to live. Wayne's World, 1991. All right. Um, and the suck -a -matic was a joke based upon an actual real product called the suck cut. <laughs> Brains full of useless trivia. So anyway... Um, I added this, uh, I recorded this just a couple, a uh, couple days ago to the video that's going to go out to about siphoning out footwells. So expect to see a little bit of a review of the suck -matic, which is basically what I just, yes, the Floby. You are correct. The Floby was the first one. Very good, David. Why are we having this conversation? Oh, I forgot the instructions because you need so many instructions for this. I'm joking. All right. Um, so that is coming up, and let's talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the 2022 Kawasaki Ultra 310 X LXS and LX. And what are my what's my take and what's my review and yada yada yada. Um, first and foremost, I'm not going to give a full review. Um, Justin, let me get this straight. This is just to clean your foot wells and won't work while on the water. I don't know if I should bother answering that because that is a insane question. It works with a garden hose. How long is your garden hose? <laughs> it's when you get home and your foot wells are full of water. It's, what, it's like if you leave your ski out in the rain or if you come in from the lawn tramp, uh, <laughs> stay out of the water, bud. <laughs> like, I got like 500 feet of garden hose. I, I, you, you lost me. <laughs> um, but 
No, it's for when you're home. It's when you're on your driveway. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Show. It's okay. I just, you really threw a curveball at me. <laughs> Sorry. I did not, I, as much as you didn't understand, I didn't understand you. All right. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, about the 310, uh, the 310 models. Um, I was supposed to have gone out in February. Watercraft simply did not arrive until the end of March. Kawasaki didn't get their units, for, quite frankly, uh, until mid to late April. The uh, the inside maintenance media team, the uh, inside corporate team who does all the R&D development, that's Minoru Kanamori, that is Bobby Kearns, that is uh, Greg Boyd, Fuzzy, uh, Greg uh, Craig Boyd. Um, and their team had to get nine... I want to say nine units fully broken in with at minimum three hours. That was the charge. So they had a few weeks to do that. And it was tough. It's, it's tough to rack up a lot of all those hours. So um, then another round of COVID went through the Irvine headquarters in California. And California needs any reason to shut somebody down and so corporate freaked and they said we're not doing anything so unfortunately i did not get to ride this stuff until this last week i mean i know there's people out there um you know who who had bought a ski they'd shown up they're like dude have you, have you ridden it yet and i go no you're riding it before i am and they're like you serious like yeah yeah that's <laughs> what it's gonna be for a little bit um, I don't think that, uh, I'm going to get my hands on stuff early for a while. Sea do will let me get my hands on stuff. Uh, but there is, uh, very unlikely I'm going to get my hands on anything from Yamaha for a while. I mean, for probably a year and a half. I mean, I, I, I don't have very high hopes. Um, Yamaha's biggest priority is to its customers, not to me, not to the media, not to anybody else. Um, so, unfortunately, Cowie, I might be getting the inside scoop on a lot of stuff, but uh, really, c is the only one who puts the media first. And there's a reason they get a lot of press because that, you know, you can see where they put their priorities and, and I'm not trying to be a jerk about it. I 100%, I 100% understand the stresses that Yamaha and their team are going through. They, they want to satisfy their customers. They want to make sure their dealers are happy. And there's a lot of people who want their skis and it's going to be like, you know what? Uh, Let's let the ginger wait. We're going to get these out to Florida to someone who paid for these. So I get it. I get it. Uh, I'm not upset. So anyhow, uh, getting my hands on all three units was a treat. Unfortunately, I really only had one day with them. Thankfully, we uh, I, I was able to put on, I think we did, I think we did about 90 miles that day. Um, a lot of hot stuff, a lot of hot riding. Um, very rarely was I ever in the back of the pack. Uh, I will tell you that the, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag with the Cowie stuff. The Cowie stuff is interesting to me because I don't want to give away my full reviews. I want to, I want to go through my notes and I want to go over some stuff and make sure I get everything perfect. But I will tell you first impressions because what the hell you guys are here. And, and it goes into our main topic. But uh, having been really, I'm really familiar with the Ultras since 2007. 
And I'm really familiar with how to write them. I'm not going to tell you I'm the best writer there is because I'm not. I'm definitely not. I am absolutely not. I am mid-pack. All right. I'm mid-pack. Uh, if I trained, I could... If I trained for a good four months, I could probably do Caro Jet if I had the finances to do it. It's four days of racing. Will I win Caro Jet? No. Will I finish it? Yeah. Unless I break. But, um, you know, Han, that's easy. Catalina, pretty damn easy. Uh, do I win? No. Do I win my classes? Occasionally. Uh, do I break down? Occasionally. <laughs> But I'm very familiar with the ultras. And so jumping on one is uh, slipping into a very comfortable pair of shoes. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's very familiar. This time around, the changes they made to how the ultra rides was absolutely what won me. What I felt the Cowie needed, they gave it. And I was very happy with that. And let me explain. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, I got distracted by the comment section. Um What they talk about when they lower their set, the rider's height, when they talk about rider height, I've never been to, I've never been to Guadalupe. I would love to McHale, but I, I've now, I've covered it for years, but I've never been. Um, I was invited to go one time and, uh, and the promoter even offered to pay my flight, but I was like, dude, I'm, I'm not the photographer. I, I, I would just be standing there just stoked. But, uh, so Kawasaki's press materials is, I don't know who's writing their press material, but it's not great. Um, and it, the problem with it is that they're not talking to diehard enthusiasts and that's who most people are going to be the first to buy these ultras are the diehard Cowie guys, the guys who bleed green. And I don't think Kawasaki understands the level of passion that Kawasaki fans have. I, I, I just don't think they're tapping into it. And when they try to tap into it, they try to tap into 1993 Kawasaki. They're not thinking the last 20 years. They're not thinking the last 15 years. They're not thinking the last 10 years. They don't, they, they do not consider that because. Kanamori and Fuzzy and some of those guys in there are in their late 50s, mid to late 50s. Some are in their 60s, some are in their mid 60s. All right. And they've been here for a long time. And so when they think of the good old days, they think of 1988. They don't think of 2002. They don't think of 2007. And that's hurting them. Okay, it's hurting them. And the press material for the new Ultra, and I'm, I'm kind of, I realize I'm not really solid on this. So I, I, I kind of need to tighten it up, but I apologize. So <laughs> um, the press material is like, oh, the overall height. Oh, the overall height is lowered three, uh, one and a half inches. Well, they're talking about seat height. Okay, great. Your sitting height is lower an inch and a half. But most ultra riders, they ride in rough water. That's why they get that ski. And what do you do when you ride rough, wa rough water? You're not on your butt. You're on your feet. You're standing up. So, interestingly, what they're not talking about is how deep the footwells are. The footwells are demonstrably deeper. I couldn't get an answer. 
I asked them, I said, how much deeper are the foot wells? And they're like, oh, we don't know. They said, oh, well, the overall height is an inch and a half. I go, no, 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 no. That's the butt height. I don't care about the butt height. I want to know the foot well depth. And they go, oh, yeah, we don't know that. And I, I said, I said to Canamori at dinner, I go, I think it's four to five inches deeper. And he goes, oh, mm, that's a lot, but maybe, maybe four inches. So he doesn't even know. And I'd love to know someone who has two skis side by side to take a tape measure and measure it. I want to know from actually Chris Stone. Chris, you're here right now and you have both skis on your trailer. I want you to go to your garage and I want you to take a tape measure and I want you to measure it from your the, the height of your seat where your butt is, not the backrest, not the little back hump thing that doesn't matter. All right. I want to know where your butt is to the bottom of the footwell on both skis, because I bet you there's a massive difference. I, I want to say it's a four inch difference. And that means a lot. And why does it mean a lot? Why is it important? Okay. For the guy who rides the ultra standing up, which I strongly recommend most people in anything above a foot should ride standing up because the ultra standing up is just a Cadillac compared to anything else standing up. It is absolutely a Cadillac compared to anything standing up. And straight down. I know. But imagine where your feet are. And it's got to be in the same location. Engage your brain. Just think about where your feet are going to be versus where your butt is if you're sitting down. Okay? Because if you ride standing up, your feet are not all the way forward like they would be standing up. They're going to be back. All right? But I want to know the deepest... I want to know the deepest number from seat to floor. All right, Chris, that's your job. I'm assigning someone something right now. But um, I guarantee you it's several inches. I want to say three to four inches. Um, but why it's important, the uh, uh, freaking <laughs> um, why this is important is because the rider standing up his ergonomics to the, his positioning for the handlebars where his shoulders are over the handlebars where his hips are and his knees because your knees should be below your shoulders and your hips you know your butt should be behind your back you shouldn't be vertical like this it should be out because you want your legs and your hips to do all the work all right Anyone who rides rough water on an ultra or rough water standing up, regardless of the brand, should know that you're letting your legs do all the work. Okay. Instead of your instead of your spine and your coccyx just going like this into the seat, you're standing up and you're letting your legs do all the work. So by lowering the foot wells, CD learned this in 2018 with the ST3 Hull. All right. They immediately got hit to this. They go, oh, shoot, we got to drop the guy. Thank you very much for the super chat. Brian, I know you got a super chat. I, I just don't want to go off. I just don't want to go off topic just yet. Um, in lowering the rider's center of gravity and bringing him closer down to the bond line, what has happened is now your weight isn't high. You're not teetering. You're lower in the ski. And that way the hull isn't bobbing in rough. It's tracking truer. And a lot of people were like, well, you're not handling. My video that I put up on Friday, they're like, oh, that's not, that's not a hard handling machine. I go, no, 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 no. I don't think you're paying attention. All right. This isn't like a GP or an RXPX. All right. You watch a, G a GP doing what I did. His bars are doing you know, the RXPX is doing this because he's correcting for the bow, all right? Because the bow is going, where should I go? I don't know where to go, all right? So you're fighting the bow the entire time. They never smoothly go in. Uh, GPFX smoothly rolls in and you're really rolling it, all right? The Ultra is not a GP1800R by any stretch of the imagination. It's light years different, okay? Far bigger ski, totally designed for different operation. 
but now you can drop a knee in that ski, get way over, and it rolls in like an FX. And it rolls so nice into the apex of a turn. I, I was floored. I was floored. I was floored by what it was done. So, that being said, what they have done is that they have unlocked handling characteristics inside of an older hull that weren't there beforehand. Now, they wanted me to really be looking at the ergonomics and looking at the seat and looking at all this stuff. And it's funny because I was I was kind of looking, it's kind of looking a gift horse in the mouth because I, they're like, oh, what do you think about the ergonomics? I'm like, it's about time. And they're like, Ugh. I'm like, dude, it's about time. <laughs> Ergolock's been around since uh, 2008. Brakes have been around since 2008. You know, you want to do the John McClane, you know, welcome to the party, pal. But I don't want to be rude about it. It was just like, you know, it, it had been so anticipated for so long that I wasn't able to enjoy it as much as I wanted to. Because I, I had been so impatient. I had been so, guys, I know you have this. Guys, I know you can execute this. What is happening? And now that it's finally here, I'm kind of like, okay, now you have a lot of ground to make up. And they're not thinking like that. The, the, the culture inside is trying to be separate or divided from what Sidhu is doing or what Yamaha is doing. But you, that's not reality. That's just not reality. You know, it's the idea that, you know, some people like to th look at the world as it could be or as it should be per their, you know, per their spectrum versus people who look at the world as it is and see how can I navigate or make the world better as it is versus how can I make the world into my utopian vision. And unfortunately, they're they're kind of living in this this utopian land where it's like, oh, well, we're just going to be over here and do our thing. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're missing the boat. You're missing so much stuff here. So why the ultra for me? I mean, and a lot of you guys are like, dude, I want to know about the stereo system. I want to know about this. I want to know about the bells and whistles. I want to know about this and this and this. And this. I'm like, that's all gravy. That's all side dishes. That's all mashed potatoes and green beans and a side salad. That's all the, I'm here to have a steak. I want to make sure that is the best tasting damn steak. If I'm going to drop a hundred bucks on a steak dinner, I want to know that is the best cut of meat I've ever had. And that means how does the ski ride? How does the ski ride? How does it feel? Okay. Turning response, rider input, cornering, rough water tracking, anything can ride nice on glass, all right? A spark that's down a cylinder can still ride nice on glass, okay? I don't care. But I want to know how that thing runs through garbage. I want to know how it runs through trash. I want to know how it navigates through big wake boat rollers. A lot of you guys don't think about that. But how much boat traffic do you come across? Where it's some guy in freaking some ski nautique you know, wake boat kicking up four foot rollers, and you're like, "Oh crap! How am I getting through this thing?" <laughs> and you're a sea dude, and that sea dude goes, -hoo -hoo -hoo! "I'm going wherever I want to go." And you know, and then you're <laughs> you're on an FX Yamaha, and it's like, "Ah, submarine <laughs> under the water." You know, <laughs> same thing with the GP. You do the same thing. Ultra, Ultra says, "Give me throttle, dude. Give me throttle. Throttle me through it." And you goes, "Whoo!" Whoa! It rolls right in. And I was like, okay. Okay, game on. Game on. Standing up, nothing is rubbing your legs because you guys are familiar with ultras know that the old handrails used to rub into rub in the inside of your legs and chafe your legs. That doesn't exist. They moved it all back. It's not there. Steering, the steering neck. Here's the funny thing. Steering neck to me felt that there was, it felt 
like there were extra points of adjustment and that it was it could go lower the throw was bigger it could go lower and it could go higher that is not the case the steering neck itself is 100% a carryover from last year the the adjustable steering and the points of articulation are 100% carryovers the difference is the pitch of the neck the neck itself rolls over why they did that did it for a couple of reasons. First, they want to get the bars a little bit further into your lap. Okay, fine. You're sitting down. You want the bar. You don't want to be reaching forward. You want your bars a little bit more relaxed. Okay, great. They did that. Uh, number two is in standing up, it actually puts the, it actually angles those bars a little further up. And in doing so, standing up, you have a very relaxed shoulder, a very relaxed arm. And you're, you got really good control standing up. And I'm like, oh, dude, dude, I'm in heaven. This is heaven. This is great. So big gains in that way. Last part of just how does the steak taste? How good of a steak is this? And how good of a ski? You know, that's what I'm really talking about. Is the all new Kawasaki engine management and complete fly-by-wire control system. Uh, the previous iterations were not fly-by-wire. They were partial fly-by-wire. This is 100% digital cable. There's no steel braided line whatsoever connecting the throttle cable to the throttle body. There's nothing. All right? It's just a cable. It's just ones and zeros. So I was concerned with throttle response. I was concerned with the mode functions. Obviously, the braking system and it, how the engine operated now that it is a digital versus analog system. Throttle response is, well, first and foremost, you start in MPO, all right? That's medium power. If you are in forward, you're going, you hold down the mode button, it'll take you into FPO, which is full power. You hit it again, it takes you into low uh, into low power, low mode, right? That's the learning key, okay? There is a no wake mode. You just go to the cruise. There, the cruise control has an up and down and a middle button. You hold down the middle button. gets you into cruise. It gets you into no wake mode, and you can toggle up or toggle down about four mile, three to four miles an hour. All right, pretty standard feature stuff. It's on c It's on Yamaha. Welcome to the party, pal. Throttle response. Well, let's talk about the break. Um, you know what? I got to take Brian's super chat. I'm getting more super chats. Let me take a second and answer super chats. Planning a 70 mile trip on open water, 30 miles to island with fuel dock, 40 miles to destination with fuel dock. 2021 RXP, RXT, one to foot, one to two foot chop. Uh, suggestions for su suggestions to plan for fuel. You'll be fine. Um. To be honest, you could go 60 miles an hour and you'll be okay. 50 to 60 miles an hour, you'll be all right. Um, Sea-Doo comes into the boost around 45 miles an hour. You're, you're, you're spooling, but it's really not generating any positive atmosphere. So, I mean, anything really remarkable reg regarding positive atmosphere. So you're not getting into the boost until around 45 miles an hour. 45, 50, you start spooling up. It starts creating positive atmosphere or boost. The injectors start to meet that extra air, and that's when you start getting into your gnarly fuel consumption. But 45 miles an hour to 45, 50, 55, you'll be gravy, honestly. Um, 45 to 55, gravy. You hit some glass, you hit some smooth spots, get on the gas, have some fun. But... You're going to tell me that your your longest stretch is 40 miles? You'll be fine, dude. You could pin the damn thing and do 40 miles. You could be pinned. I mean, wide open pinned. I think you'll be fine. Guys do it all the time. Racers do it all the time. It's an 18-gallon tank. Well, it's a 21. No. Yeah, a 21. 21 will do it. Yeah, 21 has an 18.5-gallon tank. Pin it. Brian, pin it. Don't be a bitch. Pin it. 
I'm kidding. But thank you for the super chat. No, no, no. Yeah, you can totally pin it. Go wide open. You'll be fine. 65, 70. You'll be fine. Hang on. Show your buddies. Get some good GoPro footage. The three words, Billy's here merchandise. <laughs> I'd have to get Billy's license for his likeness, and I don't want to pay him. Billy's a friend, but I don't really want to pay him royalties for his likeness. I don't know. <laughs> don't be a bitch, pin it. <laughs> Brian, I'm teasing. I'm sorry. I don't I don't I don't want I'm not trying to make you a butt of a butt of a joke. I was just teasing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You can totally dude 40 miles. 40 miles. Pin it. You'll be fine. Top that thing off as best you can. And squeeze the hell out of it. Why knuckle it? Scare your buddy. Dude, 70 miles wide open throttle. Totally. Totally do it. Why not? You only live once, right? Do it. See, dude. Do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, hey, Jason, money talks, dude. I'll tell you what, I lost, I remember being 16 years old and I lost a street race to an Integra Type R. Oh, broke my heart. <laughs> I was in a, I was in my 73 Camaro 350. It was a dog. I think that thing made 260 horse. It was a dog. And uh, air conditioning, power steering, power brakes. It was a dog. Uh, but it was a split, bump, a split bumper LT car. It was neat. Corvette white, black interior, black vinyl top. It was a neat car. Um, but I didn't have any money in it because I was a dumb kid and I lost the street race and I was so upset. Oh, I was so upset. And my older brother came out and he's like, Oh, what's your problem? And I was like, Oh, I got my ass kicked by freaking Acura. And he laughed and laughed and laughed. And he rode me the oh god, he gave me a hard time. And he goes, and he starts talking about when he started losing the street when he lost the street race. And he goes, Kevin, I'm gonna tell you. There is always going to be someone willing to spend more money than you <laughs> to win. There's always going to be. So you got to find, you know, you don't have to pay me, Kevin. Put the funds in the channel. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I always kind of laugh. So, yeah, Jason's saying, all right, another guy had another GP with eight grand in it. I'm like, well, yeah, there's always going to be someone. There's going to be some guy who's going to pour freaking 20 grand in the ski. And you're like, okay. Okay. You know. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's like, you know, you watch Hydro Drags. You watch those dudes. And, um, you know, and they're going 100, you know, they're in the 100 teens, 120s. You're like, okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's funny. But um, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be someone willing to spend the money that you're not. <laughs> you're going to be like, dude, this is a jet ski. I'm, all right, I'm, all right. I'm good. I just want to ride the damn thing. So um, yeah, the mode, the mode functionality, the, the I had a, I had a I, guy, I had beef with the mode functionality because you couldn't do it on the fly. You had to be at idle. It's not like you're going 30 miles an hour and you're running out of, or you're going 40 miles an hour and you're running out of gas. And you're like, I got to put this thing in learning mode just so that I, I'm, you know, not eating up the gas. And so you can't hit learning mode and back off. It won't let you do that. Or, hey, I stupidly started this thing in, in medium power and my buddies are all hot rods. I got to stop, put it in full and then get on the gas again. You're like, oh, dude. Come on, get the training wheels off this damn ski. But throttle response, supernatural. Not, not supernatural. It's just very natural. Throttle response is there. Um, engine management, very good. Some people are saying they're encountering not, uh, knock sensor problems. I sent a text out to Cowie and they're like, bring it in. But that's news to us. And then the first thing out of their, actually the first thing out of their mouth was they put the wrong gas in it. And I'm like, dude swears he doesn't. <laughs> he wrote back, he goes, pretty sure he did. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a, a, an oopsie and, and put some mid-grade in there or put something in that wasn't supposed to be in there. Um, 
Yes, you can change modes on uh, on the fly with the CD. Um, no, Ray, that you could also take a shower with your pants on. <laughs> no, no. Br breaking in a Kawasaki takes a an hour, you know, maybe an hour and a half. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I'm an A, 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 O. Is that ask? No, no. I don't know what A, O means. Um, no, what the break-in process is alternate the throttle, you know, pin it, cruise, pin it, cruise, pin it, cruise. You're, you're just supposed to alternate the throttle on a Cowie. Cowies and Yamahas. Those engines are bench tested before they're in skis. Okay, it's not like a Yam. It's not like a Sea Doo. Sea Doos are not broken in or bench tested prior to going into skis. That's why Yamaha only needs an hour, hour and a half. That's why Cowie only needs an hour, hour and a half. Now, I will tell you. I will tell you this: is anyone who knows those Ultra engines will swear that as they get more hours on them, they go faster, all right? And that might sound like voodoo, black magic. It's true. A ski with two hours or three hours is slower than a ski with five or six hours. I'm not lying, all right? How is that possible? Um, I've heard, I've heard a whole lot of different philosophies and ideas on this. Most are mechanically sound. Um, it's primarily to do. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. Um, learning key is not going to help you. I, in fact, unless you have people that you plan on putting on with learning key, I'd say throw the learning key in a desk drawer somewhere. Learning key, you have learning mode. Put it on. Boop. Learning mode. Okay, here you go, dingus. Go ahead and try it. But then again. I would not put anyone on the ski that I would trust or that I would only trust in learning mode. And I've put very young children behind the handlebars of jet skis. And I've never put them in learning mode. All right? Billy Duplessis watched me cruise at, what, 65 miles an hour with my six-year-old daughter driving with the cruise control on. And I sat on the back seat. So I, I, I don't like learning modes, learning keys, all that kind of crap. I don't, you know, of course I, <laughs> I uh, also grew up in the generation where we didn't have to wear bicycle helmets either. So <laughs> anyways, um, so, yeah, breaking in the ski, just follow the manual and just use regular operation keys and just alternate the throttle. Don't be Mr. Drag Race guy, but alternate the throttle like you're supposed to every 30 to 45 seconds or whatever and just alternate the throttle. That's all you need. See, do you need to alternate the throttle for five hours until the ECU opens up? Or you could reflash the ECU and say Kevin's full of crap, and I don't care what he has to say. And here I go off to the wild blue. Uh, blue blah, blah, blah. Oh, I think I've had a stroke. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't talk today. You know, but off into the wild blue yonder. You can do whatever you want. Again, you don't have to listen to me. It's cool. I'm not going to be insulted. <laughs> You're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> so um, throttle response, really, really good. Uh, Coming, coming out of air, coming into a curve, apexing through, uh, apexing through a turn. All the things that I was concerned about in regards to throttle control were choice. We're totally on. Last thing, how does the thumb brake work? Like, how well does it work? Um, first, <laughs> you can actually take your finger, pull it off the front and push it forward <laughs> and the you can apply the brakes by pushing the throttle forward which i 
thought was inter- interesting because that literally means that the throttle and the brake knob are literally one piece of plastic. They're just one piece. I my initial understanding was that the the brake and the throttle indexed into each other and had a coil spring in there so that as pressure was applied onto the brake, it would back off the throttle, but they literally just made it one piece. I guess that's easier. Um, But if you're going full clip, I mean, like you're really tearing on it and you slam on that thumb brake, it is not going to hit like the Yamaha, which I think hits the hardest. And it's not going to hit like the IBR, which is pretty damn close to the ride brake. It slows down slowly. Um, It just eases. And you're not going to get the... Yamaha, if you get on the ride, you left-handed, you get on the ride, you know, the ride lever, and you pull on it, that ski produces so much reverse thrust that it kicks the tail out. It goes, Whoop! and it'll pull out. You're definitely not going to get that with the Cali. Um, Now, uh, I will tell you, uh, both Yamaha and Sea-Doo will submerge the back of the ski if you're just going full, just pinned reverse. Kawasaki will, uh, if you watch the tack, it won't spin above 3,000 RPM. So your reverse will not yank you back all right if you're going around a marina and you're goofing off in reverse it's not going to do it now if you pin the bars and you got the throttle or you got the reverse totally pinned it will start to spin around and i found uh, you know they'll all spin around but you'll actually start to fill up your foot wells and it will start to i mean it will start to get a little squirrely and a little you know a little off center um but um only if you do not have the extended deck. So the LX and LXS, um, uh, yeah, Chris. Oh, yeah, you're living you're living testimony of that. Um, they won't they won't dip the tail. The X, the three ten X, will bring the tail into the water. It will pull the water. You know, will pull the tail in. So. Okay, bells and whistles. All right. I realize this is turning into more of a review rather than like future tech, but a couple things. Um, Kawasaki told me, and both Kanamori and the media rep gentleman named John Rawl, who I've known John since 2007. I consider John a very good friend. Um, I mean, John sent... John sent, you know, congratulation notes and cards when our kids were born. I mean, I get, I get Merry Christmas notes from him. And I mean, I've known John for a long time. Um, They kind of shrugged and they said, man, this has not been an easy row to hoe. And I said, oh yeah, well, what's up? And he said, all the 2022s were supposed to have come out last year for 21. I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah. He goes, but getting keyed up for manufacturing, we had to wait. And I was like, oh, man. He goes, yeah, because we didn't want to do a half run and then another half run and then another half run. They said, we wanted to do a full production run. So we had to wait till we had all the materials and all the parts good to go. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you got to kid me. And they go, yeah, yeah, it killed us. We had all this material ready. We had all this stuff ready to launch. And we couldn't do it. It, There were supposed to be 21 models. They were were supposed to come out. The 310X and the 310LX and the 310LXS were supposed to have come out the same time as the RXPX 300 and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, wow, that sucks. He goes, yeah. So what that kind of does is it log jams their production of future skis. And he says, well, we have new stuff coming out in the next three years. I said, what? And he goes, every year we got, we got something new coming out. I go, no, you don't. He goes, yeah, we do. I said, well, that's very unlike Cowie. He goes, yeah, tell me about it. 
Next year, um, or for 24, 23, excuse me, for 23, uh, the naturally aspirated, uh, the naturally aspirated LX. Um, that's what's coming out. Now, I had a, I had a long talk about the LX and the LX market. And I was like, so is there going to be two versions of the LX? And he goes, no, why? I said, well, obviously there's the base model. That makes sense. Naturally aspirated base model. And he goes, right. Yeah, it'll be a you know, white upper deck and mild colors, nothing too crazy. I said, okay. And I presume there's going to be a fully loaded naturally aspirated ski. And they looked at me and they're like, no. And I said, what do you mean no? And they're like, no, no, that stuff belongs on the premier ski. I go, what about the guy? What about the 65 year old guy who he and his old lady want to go ride for a weekend and they want the sound system and the windscreen and the USB port and the adjustable seats and all the jazz with the rear, you know, the multi-mount rack on the back, but he doesn't want the gnarly fuel mileage. He wants good fuel mileage. And they looked at me like I was a dog doing funny sounds. It was like, eh? and they're like, well, no, you get the, you get the 310 LX. I go, no, you don't. I said, Yamaha sells every single FXHO cruiser that they build. If they doubled the production run of the FXHO cruiser, they'd still sell every one of them. Are you guys not seeing that? And they're like, well, you know, ah. no, no, no. It was a it was a full stop. It was a full stop, I, I, and it was at dinner at this wonderful steakhouse. And then everyone's dressed up, and I'm sitting there like, ah! I'm like pulling my hair out, going like, "You guys are ignoring that. How are you ignoring that whole market?" And they're like, "Well, you know, I mean, you can option out the 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 LX." I go, "Yeah, but it's not going to be in some cool color. It's not going to be in like some metallic gold or." you know, graphite gray or whatever, you know, you know, whatever Lexus color you guys want to want to steal. And finally, Kanamori looks at me and he goes, well, do you think there's a market for it? Yeah, there's a market for it. <laughs> there's a market for it. And I just, I, I was so floored. I was so floored. I was so <laughs> baffled that it was not even considered. I'm like, guys. And I mean, the R is coming out and it's going to be, well, they're going to have the same, ex same exact, same exact steering neck, steering setup, non-adjustable, fixed aluminum steering neck. Black, likely green, new design seat. Uh, it's not going to have the rear. It's not going to have the extension on it because of weight. Um, and good Lord, if they put freaking green sponsons on it, I'm going to send anthrax in a letter. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. I'm like, guys, you got to make the R worth something. It's got to be, it's got to be worth something. It's got to have what, You've been teasing. It's got to have traction control off the KT, uh, off the bikes, off the KXs. It's got to have the, the it's got to have the traction control. It's got to have launch control. But of course, the other skis have launch control too. You can go get a 310X and it has launch control on it. So I was just really floored. I was just really, really floored. Um, they are, uh, to your question regarding fishing, they're going to have accessories on the rack that they have. Um, they're going to have accessories that you can put rod holders and a cooler, but don't expect a trophy. They're not going to have a live well. They're, I don't know of a GPS yet that's going to be available. Um, it, it's, it's going to be an accessory afterthought. It's not going to be a dedicated model. So don't expect a dedicated fishing model. It's not going to happen. Um, 
What's the best fishing ski from Yamaha? FXHO. FXHO. The same one that they recommend. Get the get the there's there's two tiers of the jet fish package. Get the get the full tier jet fish package on an FXHO. Um yeah, that's gonna be a tough one, Chris. Um but that Cowie deck, I don't know. Um we'll have to get the different mounts, you know, the slide in mounts and um just modify our rack to fit that but uh we did the link you know we have the link mounts for our rack our fuel system doesn't work on skis with link so it's kind of a catch-22 so um cowie's platform redesigned ultra platform is going to go to the lx's next year uh, the R is 24. Um, so 23 is LX, uh, with a couple other changes I'm not really supposed to talk about, but we all knew that one was coming. That was pretty speculative. And they didn't tell me that they didn't say Kevin next year is going to be no, but I'm smart enough to put two and two together. And then four 24 is going to be the 310 R, um, and that's going to be how it's going to be. But there is a uh, um, something special coming out. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be 23 or 24. I kind of reason it's going to be 24. Um, but Kawasaki is going to add something to the SXR1500 uh, offerings that I think a lot of vintage guys are going to like. And that's why I was kind of making the comments of, you know, the comments of people um, uh, living in 1993. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it's good. The good old days. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Reel it in a little bit. Reel it in a little bit. Um, I did ask about the STX 310 that uh, K-Speed built and if they'd ever put their hands on it. And they said, no, we have not put our hands on it. But we have every single inch of coverage and details from Jamie Ede at K-Speed on how to build it. And they said, it's very doable. It's very doable. And I said, that makes me think that it's going to happen. And they go, hmm, probably not. I said, really? And they go, yeah. And I was like, okay, well. They're not. They're not looking to. They're not looking at building a a, a mid size supercharged close course killer. They just aren't. And that is no. It's not a smaller SXR. Definitely not smaller. It's actually probably going to be maybe a little heavier. <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but I can't. I can't spill the beans on that one yet. I really can't because they trusted me with stuff, and I'm like, ah. Eh, Ah, you know, I want to talk about it, but um, I can point, I can leave some really big hints. Um, uh, if you've ever heard of unlimited PWC out of Japan, they advertise on the Watercraft Journal. I want you to go look at what they offer for the SXR. Because Kawasaki really likes something that they offer for the SXR 1500. So they're going to make their own version of it. So anyhow, I got updates on my 70 Super B. Metal work's getting done. Anyway, uh, I am a man who serves two masters. I do both jet skis and Mopar and Mopar magazines. And I'm getting updates on my phone about stuff on my car, <laughs> on my other project car. My charger's actually kind of work done <laughs> for a little bit until the Hemi motor goes in it. And then I start breaking all new things. <laughs> And then I twist the car so bad the back glass blows out. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I've ruined my car with making 800 pound feet of torque. Um, anyways, so uh, uh, to the point, what I I feel like, okay, all right, I, I'm going to put it all out there. 
Um, make model year, John. Um, let's see what question. Warning, but are there any supercharged skis you can just turn the supercharger off and on? It? All right, Christian, I like this question. I, I love this question. It's actually a pet question of mine. I like this one. Uh, Christian asks, stupid question warning, but are there any supercharged skis that you can just turn the supercharger off and on? Um, how many of you guys remember the Road Warrior with Mel Gibson? All right. That's effectively the Mad Max movie that most people remember as Mad Max because that's the one that was sold internationally, came to the States. The original Mad Max is a very young Mel Gibson, and he's kind of a future police officer in Australia. And his wife and young son get run down by, you know, this biker gang. And so Max becomes Mad Max. He goes on this vengeance and starts killing the bikers. All right. Well, they're not bikers. They're, you know, they drive all sorts of different cars and things like that. But um, in The Road Warrior, which we all know as Mad Max, He's driving a, is it a, it's a Ford Falcon. Is it an XB? I think it's an XB is what they called it. And he had this, he had this Hawaiian blower sticking out of the hood and he's driving and, and he's got to catch. It's an XB. Thank you. And, uh, I, I it's a neat car and they look great. Um, but he's driving the XB and he's got his well, he, he's on the right hand side because he's Australian. And his dog, he's got he's got you know, obviously a blue healer with a bandana around his neck, sitting in a shotgun seat. And he's trying to chase this guy down, and he reaches over to the shifter and he hits the button, and all of a sudden the camera goes to the to the front of the car and they they mock it up, it's fake. So the supercharger goes whoop and spools up, and all of a sudden the car goes and sort of take off. It's really funny. All right. So <laughs> that's one of my favorites is like, oh, dude, the supercharger kicked on. No. Um, to your answer, the answer is no. Superchargers are crank driven, whether by an actual, uh, by a belt or sometimes by a, a timing chain. Um, super Centrifugal superchargers are driven by a gear or, or by the timing chain. Excuse me, I wasn't clear on that one. Um, uh, root style superchargers are are typically always driven by a belt, and centrifugal superchargers are driven mainly. Uh, well, I mean, if you get like a Paxton or a Vortec, that's a belt drive, but um, a, a, a shaft drive, a gear drive, that also is. Um, you know, like obviously, Cedus and Yamahas are gear shaft driven. So, uh, uh, Brian, you're half close. You're half close. But, um, here's how you can kind of cheat. Uh, here's how you can kind of cheat with a supercharger. Now, I have seen guys who cheat with a turbo. And how they cheat with a turbo is that they can computer control. Um, they can computer control the blow-off valve on turbo, which means that the blow-off valve is open. I mean, just completely opens up. And so all the boost that's generated by the turbo system is being scrubbed off by the blow-off valve until it's engaged. Um, I've seen it on some really high dollar things. Um, I've seen it in some really high dollar applications. Uh, I have not seen it on a jet ski ever. Um, and you know, most guys who put a turbo on their car, they're, they're cobbling together a, a, a turbo kit out of spare parts. Um, so there's, there's a way to, to scrub boost and then turn it on but not with watercraft. Um, when it comes to jet ski superchargers, the clutch technology is not there. There's no way to, to disengage and then engage because once you engage, 
you're having a problem of clutches locking up, you can't do tooth to tooth. You'd shear the teeth right off. So you can't do a gear drive. It would have to be clutches. And you'd have to have a you'd have to have a dog, you'd have to have a dog gear. You'd have to have something to engage that clutch at speed. And the problem is that if you were to do that, and all of a sudden all that centrifugal boost goes blowing through the throttle body, um, you would have to have your injectors, you'd have to have two sets of injectors. So there would be, I mean, you could run with multiple, you know, multiple duty, you know, adjustable duty injectors, or you could just run two injectors per cylinder. And that second injector is dumping way more fuel in order to counter all the extra boost. But really there, there just isn't a functional on switch supercharger. There just isn't. Um, the potential is there. It's just making the system work. And so that's been kind of the problem. Hey guys, can get, can we get the likes closer to a hundred? Let's get the likes to a hundred. I, I don't think we have a lot of people here. I've been rambling this whole damn time. This hasn't been a really good informative one. Um, but, uh, I got a big trip tomorrow. Um, I get to ride. I'm finally going to ride the, I'm, I'm going to go test review the trophy on Tuesday. And so that's going to be a lot of fun. And I've just been, that's been one I've been waiting for. And um, so I'm, I got plates spinning. <laughs> I got a lot, I got a lot of things I got to do. Um, all right. Uh, I got a super chat from Hamera. Hamera writes, Hey, Kevin had to replace the throttle body actuator on my 2016 RXT. Most writing is salt. All I, most writing is salt. I do all the flush miss WD-40. What can I do to avoid it happening again? Um, well, the actuator should be sealed. The actuator should be a sealed unit. Um, so if you had corrosion inside of that actuator, that means the actuator, A, did not have a good seal. Yikes. B, you're getting a lot of moisture inside of that engine compartment. So what I strongly recommend is taking your seats off and letting it vent when you're not using it. Letting that engine compartment vent. Um, if you have it covered on the side yard or in the backyard or whatever, just crack the seats, crack, open up everything you can so you get some air ventilation. That's, you got to get some air circulation so that the moisture dries up. Um because if you got a lot of moisture that's trapped inside of that engine compartment, that actuator will probably corrode again. Um, be careful about spraying down and washing down your electronics in your engine compartment. I don't, I, like I said, I put it on mist and I spend 10, you know, 10 seconds misting down as best as I can. And then I oil everything else down. You don't need to hose the engine compartment. Okay. You're, you're not washing your car. You are misting down the engine compartment. So you just want to get that salt off. You want to loosen up that salt because it's going to be baked onto your engine. It's going to be baked onto the metal stuff. It's going to be baked onto your engine. It's going to be baked onto all those hot surfaces. So you just want to break it up, you know, get it wet to help break it up. And then the WD-40 or the penetrating oil that you're using is to help scuff that stuff off and then coat all those surfaces. So hopefully that helps out. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Trophy review next week. No, it's going to take a month for that thing to happen. If not two. Um, sorry guys, all this stuff should have happened months ago, but anyway, so what ultimately is to be understood about Kawasaki? Um, Kawasaki, I feel made of the right sacrifice play and the right sacrifice play was delaying the, delaying the models for until 2022 so that they could do a full production run. Good. And they even had a limited production run this year. 
they told you we're going to cut production of the SX, STXs. We're going to limit productions of the SXRs just so that it can be all hands on bait, all hands on deck for the Ultra 310s. It's understandable. Okay. Because right now, material is very hard to come by. Um, going forward, what are they looking at? Okay. Are they going to radically expand their dealer network? Probably not. All right. It's just kind of where they're at right now. They want the product to speak for itself. They want the product to be attractive enough that a person will drive past the Sea-Doo dealer and go to the Kaw you know, Kawasaki dealer and say, I want to go check these things out. All right. They also want to be comparable to Kawasaki or Ka Kawasaki wants to be comparable to c and Yamaha by offering all the same features. So cruise control, no wake mode, different speed modes, um, phone integration. Well, Yamaha is the only guy you can make phone calls from. I don't ever, ever want to make a phone call from a jet ski unless I'm doing something silly. Um, but I don't want to receive phone calls when I'm on the water. Oh, thank you. Um, CD has got the integrated GPS. It's in the dashboard. That's something that is a little bit of a brass ring for a lot of people. Yamaha now has the full color GPS, full color dashboard, which is great. Um, that bigger dash needs to go onto the bigger, onto all of the skis. There needs to be an option. Something, the five inch screen is not enough. But Kawasaki is finally eating up some of the slack. What I feel is I am concerned with how the ski rides first. That's how I always feel. Second, ergonomics. How, well, number one, how does the ski ride? How does it ride in rough? Because I'll tell you what, any ski rides good in glass. But when it gets in rough and you're on a ski that sucks in chop, you want to pull the drain plugs and you want to just leave it at the bottom of the lake. You're done. You hate it. You resent it. And then it sits on the, and then it sits on the side of your house and you're making payments on a ski that you resent. Because you're like, this thing beats the crap out of you. Beats the crap out of you. I don't want to ride it. So... Now you're stuck with something you don't want anymore. So number one, how's the ski ride? Okay. How's the ski ride? Throttle response. How does it corner? How does it track? Does it do anything stupid? Does it do anything unpredictable? Does it roll over? Does it, is it off-centered? Is it whatever? There's a million different things that can happen. Is it a wet ride? Is it a dry ride? Is it a comfortable ride? Is it nose plowing? What is it doing? All right. Number one, how does the ski ride? Number two, ergonomics. Do I fit on it? Is it comfortable? After two hours, do I hate this thing? Or after two hours, I'm still very comfortable. That should be number two. All right. That is the seat, seating position for your height and weight. I'm six foot two, 240 pounds. There's not a lot of people here who is six foot two and 240 pounds. So what fits me might not fit you. There's guys here who are six foot five and 340 pounds. And they're like, dude, I'm a big guy. I need a big ski. Okay. Understood. You know, I don't want to see that dude on a Yamaha EX trying to go, <laughs> you know, it's like a Russian bear on a, on a bicycle at a circus. It's not going to work. So number two, number two, how does it fit? Ergonomics. Number three, that's when you start getting into the weeds. Oh, what's the storage like? You know, can I reach the storage? Is the glove box deep? Do I like the side storage? Yes, I do. Do I think it's great? Eh, I, I, get, I give it a B plus, A minus. Is it better than the middling glove, glove box on all STX uh, CDs? Guaranteed. That's the worst one on my list. Yamaha still has the best glove box. Yamaha's FX glove box, you can stick your head inside of it. It's so big. All right, I love it. Um, easy to access. It's great. Can you open up the side goal wings while you're riding? Dude, I was going 50 miles an hour getting GoPros out. In fact, I fished this GoPro on a selfie stick at full throttle, full throttle 
in six inch to a foot wind wind blown chop. Nothing bounced out of that side compartment at full throttle, 67 miles an hour, 66 miles an hour. Um, went yoink, pulled it out, turned it on, took some camera footage, put it back in. All right. There's there's a little pot, there's a lip that goes around it so stuff won't fall out. It's pretty stinking good. Um, but that's like my third or fourth. Third or fourth is storage and features. And way down on my list, honestly, really, on my priorities list, is how big is the dash? Is it full color? Is it touchscreen? You know, where... Where's the control? Where are the controls for the sound system? How well is the sound system synced to my phone? Can I pause the sound system? How loud is it? Can I hear it at full speed? That stuff is all there, but dude, that is so far down the priority list for me. Now, my priorities are not your priorities. Your priorities might, are, might be like, I, I color and sound system. Okay. Color and sound system. Great. Okay, cool. We're on different, we're on different levels, but that's fine. But ultimately, ultimately, it's gonna be how does a ski ride? Um, I I have major, major criticisms of the new ultra. That'll be in my review. Um, will they be fixed anytime soon? Very, very unlikely. Probably a minor update in six or seven years. That might change it. All right. Um, because it cha- it requires changing the mold. And, and what it is, I'm not hiding anything, is the fact that they shrank the opening for the front storage bin. It's small. It's too small. You can't put a helmet in there. Which I don't know how many people are putting helmets in. You can't put a five gallon gas can in there. If you try to shove a big backpack in there, you're shoving it in there and then trying to get it out. Oh, God bless you if you can. All right. They made the opening way too small. And the reason why they made the opening way too small is because that hood tapers in like a Formula One race car and it's a pure aesthetic choice. It is 100% an aesthetic choice. That hood can be redesigned tomorrow, but that still won't change the mold for the top where that opening is. You'd have to go in there and sawzall it open, but then you won't have that nice lip that goes around that seals the water from coming in. So, kind of sucks. I grilled the hell out of them about the engine cover because if you guys don't know you pull the seats off the engine compartment is 100 sealed it is sealed it's sealed shut there is a insulting little plastic view window that you can look at your engine and wave at it and you can flip it open and check your oil and that's it Um, I believe in the draft of my, of my review, the word I used is idiotic. I'll probably change that word before it goes to print, but I, I, I was so close to saying to Kanamori, I said, whoever, whoever thought of that idea deserves shame upon them and their family, which to a Japanese man. <laughs> I said they should be shamed. You know, I wanted to be like Eddie Murphy on Mulan. It's like, shame on you, shame on your family, shame on your cow. Shame. <laughs> it's like shame. You should be shamed. They, they, they should be chased out of town. I, I thought it was so such a bad idea. And then I listened to him. <laughs> I was like, why does this exist? And he said. It was the only way, it was the only way that we could get the seats small enough. 
And he goes, because we wanted a narrow seat. We wanted to narrow the seat all the way around. We wanted it really narrow at the front. We wanted it narrow, narrow, narrow. But the only way we could design it that we could think of that it would seal up the engine compartment and have the narrow seat that we wanted was if we had that panel. He goes, and the panel is held on by like six acorn screws. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to pop off. But that panel allows them to have a more narrow seat. And they said that was more, that was more of a, that was the narrowed seat and the better ergonomics. And there is a nice, very nice knee cove that comes in. They've got a little textured on the plastic. Like, you know, I'm like, well, that's not really a knee pad. I don't know why you guys are even bothering putting the texture in there, but okay. Um, but they did say the number one reason was because we wanted the ergonomics of the narrow seat. And that was why that cover exists. I go, well, Yamaha did the exact same thing. And he goes, yeah, they have a, what they call an upper deck, and the upper deck um, goes over the lower deck, and that allows them to step it up to a more narrow seat. And he goes, that's really what we ended up doing. And I said, so it wasn't to keep people from getting into their engine compartment? And he goes, no, not really. Um, he says, we interview owners, and most owners don't do their own maintenance. And I was like, oh, dude, no, don't say that. Don't. Don't go down that path. Um, but he he was like, well, you know, again, the mechanically inclined guy can pull the seat and then take an impact or, you know, a little driver, a little electric driver, you know, with an eight mil. Is it an eight mil? I think it's an eight mil. A little eight mil acorn. JD, I know you've taken it off. Tell me what size that acorn is. I know you're here too, J JD. Is it an eight or a 10 mil? It's just a little, it's just a little chrome acorn. And you just go whoop, 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 whoop. It's a 10. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you just take all six of them off. Off it goes. And you got the full engine compartment. Okay. You know, but again, look what Sea Doo did. Sea Doo has 13 of those stupid torque screws. So you're kind of like, fine. <laughs> you kind of just accept it. You go, okay, fine. All right. So anyway, um, I'm kind of done. I've been I, I've been answering questions as I go along. Um, I have stainless steel thumb nuts. Okay. Send me a picture, JD. Email me a picture. Um, so anyway, uh, I know that wasn't super revelatory as to what's coming out. I couldn't get into big detail on. Um, some of the stuff that was told to me when I, when it comes at, it's funny when I can like make predictions and just talk about my predictions because I, I haven't had hard confirmation, but when I get quiet about future stuff, that means that I've been told. <laughs> so, uh, Hey, thank you, Mikey. Yeah, but you didn't say anything. You didn't have a question. Oh, he did have a question. Hey, can you give us a little info on how to get into racing? Okay, I'll answer this for Mikey, and then I'll pull. Um, okay, so first and foremost, A, look at what kind of regional racing is around you. All right, what events exist around you? Are they offshore? Are they closed course? Are they stand-up? Are they sit-down? Are they mixed? Are they aquacross? Are they... Uh, pro water cross is it a local event is it a regional event is it national just get a good idea of what's close to you all right number one number two take an honest assessment of how good of a rider you are and what kind of ski you're going to be racing all right if you own a spark or an ex you obviously can't get into the pro you know pro am runabout class with a 60 horsepower spark you're going to have to find what, what class your watercraft belongs in, okay? Then, the easy part, get good at riding. Get good. You find a, if you got a, a small body of water and some friends, put out some buoys. If you don't know where to find buoys, go to Target and buy a bunch of those hippity hops 
you know, those balls with the little round handles that you used to bounce around on your butt with your, you know, when you were like five, buy a bunch of those and some nylon rope and some old dumbbells and put out those as boobs. All right. If you can't afford those, you're totally piss poor. A, don't get into jet ski race. B, get a bunch of milk cartons, you know, or white Tropicana orange juice bottles. Screw the top on it. Tie a rope around the handle and do that. Just as long as it's visible. Then clean up your mess when you're done. When you're done, round up all your booze, put them in your truck, and go home. But start getting good. No, uh, let's see. That would be three. So four. Number four is make sure you have the right safety equipment that's required for your class. So if your class says you need to have a full wetsuit or a, at least a john, which means, you know, sleeveless but long legs, you know, full legs, get the right riding gear. Get an approved life vest. Probably get a set of gloves. They usually recommend that you recommend or, or even require that you have gloves. All right. If you need a liat brace or a neck brace, make sure you get the right neck brace. Get a DOT helmet. You have to have an approved motocross style helmet, not a full face bell motorcycle helmet, but a motocross helmet and not a small BMX bike helmet either. You want a DOT motocross helmet. All right. Take that, take a, a tip from me, take that helmet, turn it upside down, pull all the foam out of the front of it because you will be sucking on that foam the first time you take a header off the into the water. That foam is going to go into your mouth. And, all right. And you're going to try to get water into your mouth. All right. Do you need to tune up the skis or can you race stock? It depends on what class you're in. There are box stock watercraft classes. I mean, box stock. There are some stock tune classes that let you put sponsons and a ride plate on. You just got to find what class. So um, I'll tell you what, Ray, for a helmet, the best, that I, right out of the gate, the easiest ones to get, I would, uh, I, I strongly recommend you go get fly racing. Fly racing, they're affordable. They do jet ski friendly stuff. Uh, the foam, dry, you know, the pads in it and all this stuff is all machine washable, dries very quickly. Don't put it in the dryer. But, you know, all the, you know, the the actual padding in there. I should bring my helmets out and show you guys. I have two. I I had four, but I got rid of two of them. I kept my two favorite. Um, but fly racing or I I was I had a I had a free helmet from Troy Lee Designs. I was sponsored by Troy Lee when I was offshore racing. Um but then I went to fly and fly was really good to me. So um, fly or Troy Lee, or there's a million other bell makes, I mean, there's a million different motocross helmets. Um, but regarding your ski, you need to take an honest assessment of what kind of ski you got and your riding skill. Go in an amateur. If you're asking me, you're amateur. All right. If you're older, you're still amateur. You're not veterans. All right. You you need to you need to look at the classes. You need to look at the rule book. Look at what the rules say. You don't want to be disqualified. You don't want to have to go through tech inspection. Look at what you're racing. Where number one regional, number two, um, what kind of class you want to race. Number three, um, get good at riding. Number four, riding gear, equipment, equip your ski, equip you. Um, and number five is make sure your pit situation is dialed, all right? If it's you and a buddy and you're in your Toyota pickup truck with a single place trailer, you can't launch it with your Toyota truck. You're going to need something, either a a side-by-side, a, -side, a quad, uh, something with a trailer hitch to, to launch that ski. They are not going to have you dropping your truck in there at a at a pro watercross event. Okay, um, you're going to have to launch using what they require, and you're going to have to ask. Now, if you're on a stand up, you can use a cart. You can use an aqua cart. You can use a jet lift. You can use a bunch of different other stuff. But again, it all depends on what class you're racing. And it depends on the venue and whose event you're racing. It just depends. So um, then you're going to want a tent, you know, an easy up. You're going to want, you know, a place to sit. You're going to want a cooler. You're going to want to be equipped. 
So there's that. Um, no, they are not going to change the glove box for the RX TX and, and GTX, the ST3 platform for 23. Guaranteed. 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 Because they would have to completely redesign where the filler neck is. They'd have to redesign that whole upper lid. It, it's going to be a it's going to be a chore to redesign that. It's going to be a chore if they were to do a glove box, and they might not be inclined to even change the glove box. They don't, you know, they don't have to do anything. They can tell you to pound sand. <laughs> They've done it before. All right. All right. So, guys, I think I'm good. Uh, we're at uh, a minute 35. A minute 35. It's an hour and 35. Um, I didn't even open up the new box of Strapinos I have to give away. So that'll be for next week. We'll give away a new set of uh, ratchet straps next week. Number six, don't be scared to pin it. Well, we'll just have you wear the T-shirt that says, don't be a bitch and pin it. <laughs> um, all right. So... Guys, thank you very much. Your salt away question has been answered in the previous video. And we will talk later. Have a good night, guys. Thank you for tuning in. It was a little bit more of a mellow one tonight. But we got some really cool stuff coming out on the video channel and some good stuff coming up on the magazine. Make sure you subscribe to the newsletter so that you get both. You do not want to miss out. All right. Have a good night.